All right, I think it's time that we get to it. I'm thrilled to roll out the latest episode of this IBM Qiskit Live Quantum Seminar Series dedicated to you, the research and academic communities. I'm your host, Lako Minif, and today I have the pleasure, pleasure and privilege of hosting here, Professor Michael Hattridge. And hello, how are you, Michael? Hey, Zlako, uh, doing great. Thanks for having me. All right, it's a real pleasure uh, to have you here, Michael. Um, these folks will probably wonder, uh, where are you? Is that hat lab that we're seeing? Uh, so the, the hat lab is under my feet. This is just in my office here at the University of Pittsburgh, uh, where you can see it's very sunny today. Well, I, you know, I can't begin uh, by not acknowledging that I think you win the award for most creative uh, lab logo. I absolutely Thanks. love the, uh, <laughs> the, the, the many details you put in there. Uh, before we get to your talk, Michael, allow me to give folks a little bit of a background. Uh, Michael uh, Hattridge is an assistant professor of physics at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, Michael received his bachelor from Texas A&M and uh, his PhD from UC Berkeley under the supervision of John Clark, which is where I had the pleasure and privilege to first uh, meet Michael. And in many ways, he's maybe my first uh, scientific advisor. Uh, Michael was then a postdoc at uh, Yale University working with Michelle DeVore. So both of us continued our trajectories in the same direction. Um, after which Michael moved to start Hat Lab at the University of Pittsburgh. Michael is the recipient of many awards, including the Michelson Postdoctoral Prize Lectureship, the NSF Career, the Sloan Research Fellowship, and the Pittsburgh Chancellor's Distinguished Research Award. And with that, Michael, uh, the stage is yours. And folks, feel free to ask questions in the comment chat box. Okay, thank you very much, Zlatko, for that very kind introduction. So, uh, to kick us off today, I'm very much a person who uh, builds circuits for a living. And so, if we're going to talk about building some quantum hardware in this talk today, it's worth kind of easing into it from this perspective of what do you need for a quantum computer? So, it kind of doesn't matter if you're using photons, electrons, spins, uh, you know, something exotic as your basis, uh, but you need some kind of well behaved quantum. Qubit, some kind of two-level system that you can then that you can create and initialize, uh, and then you need to be able to controllably couple these qubits together. You also have to do individual qubit controls, and then you have to efficiently and individually measure them. And so, when you put it all together, then you kind of get this new kind of sort of fake quantum matter, uh, where it may be built out of big stuff like you're going to see in my talk today, like aluminum blocks and sapphire chips. But effectively, it acts like a few. Uh, sort of artificial atoms that now really don't obey the laws of classical mechanics anymore, you know, hopefully obey the laws of quantum mechanics and we can use them to, to do lots of stuff. Um, however, uh, of course, reality is a little bit less clean than this. If all of those things I showed you on the previous slide were perfect, then we would be good. We would just build, you know, machines with a few hundred, few thousand bits, and we would do very exciting things. But of course, in real life, the qubits are lossy, the gates are wrong, the measurements have errors in them. And so um, there's this kind of disconnect with sort of where we want to be up here in this white fluffy cloud of a fully functional quantum computer, and where we actually are in real life down here towards the bottom of this hierarchy of scales. Because of course, what we have to do is build machines that can first detect their own errors and then correct their own errors, then take a big machine and protect inside it some smaller quantum machine, right? So this is one of the reasons uh, we don't have these machines already. And definitely in terms of orientation for today's talk, there's sort of two tracks, I think, that are both being very productively followed uh, in the field right now, which is one track is to take a machine and build up the size and build up the complexity with sort of a, a route that we understand and try to climb this ladder. And I think uh, various companies, big and small, are, are doing a good job of leading the way on that. Um, and in laboratories like mine, where I really can't build a 100 qubit machine, you know, there's another approach which is to say, well, can we shortcut this ladder? Can we sort of make it easier to build these machines that can that can protect themselves, that can do useful calculations via new qubits, via new hardware? And, and really the thing I'm going to talk about today is a control scheme as a way of hooking up qubits uh, and cavities together in a way that we think can maybe help shortcut this, help get us to build our machines faster with maybe a little bit less brute force. So uh, just again, I know there's people from around the world for continued orientation. 
all of our qubits and all of our quantum states are basically microwave uh, photonic states that we trap in superconductors at very low temperatures. So if you start with our basic Hamiltonian here of something like a microwave harmonic oscillator, you can sort of think of it as an inductor uh, shunted by capacitor. There's charge on the capacitor, flux in the inductor, and you can write a harmonic oscillator uh, Hamiltonian. It looks just basically like your spring mass system that you study in classical mechanics or again in quantum mechanics. And then we can have these what are called raising and lowering operators, A dagger and A, which represent moving up and down this ladder of photon states in the system uh, where we have zero or one or two photons. We can realize this either in sort of lumped systems where you see here a thing with really looks like this capacitor in the Hamiltonian, a thing which really looks like the inductor in the Hamiltonian, or we can do extended bodies uh, where basically we're building sort of transmission line systems where light can kind of bounce back and forth uh, to form, form these microwave modes. And the problem that, that we have at this level, right, why we can't stop here is that these harmonic oscillators don't don't have handles. They don't have controls that we can grab hold of and, for instance, move between only the two lo lowest levels, which you consider a transmon or uh, some kind of qubit, and not, for instance, populate the higher states. And so in superconducting circuits, we really have one trick. It's a very useful trick, which is to embed in these circuits what are called Joseph's injunctions. So you saw, for instance, the superconducting circuits on the previous slide. Now I'm going to graft in <coughs> a a circuit which is two superconductors separated by, let's say, a nanometer-ish thick insulating barrier. This, this element here has a critical current, a maximum current that can flow through it. And when I instead treat it as like a microwave object, I can say that it, well, it looks like a capacitor, so it has a self-capacitance, but it also has a nonlinear inductance. And so now I rewrite my Hamiltonian. I write minus Ej cos phi, which is the, the phase across this, this element. And I can expand this, this out and find that the bottom two terms here look just like a harmonic oscillator again. But now I have higher order terms. I have nonlinear terms in the Hamiltonian. And, and in, the, in the talk I'm giving today, that's exactly what we're gonna zoom in. Anytime we have terms that are higher order than second, that have more than two of these operators in them, we're gonna see that that's a knob. We can reach in and grab the system by that knob and then control it. Um, one of the other really neat things about Joseph's injunctions in these in laboratories in, in these companies where we build with them is that we can build them very, very large. So this is a big junction that's part of an amplifier that I'll tell you about, or we can build them very, very small. In fact, the dynamic range of the biggest to smallest junctions we can make in the laboratory is, I don't know, something like a thousand or 10,000. So not only can we inject these nonlinearities into our system, we can really control the energy scale just by which circuits we build. Okay. So that's our basic building blocks, and that's how we build transmons and amplifiers and everything else you see in a superconducting circuit. We're really just going to do uh, more fine rearrangements of which junctions and where and which inductors and which capacitors and so on. The really common example of this that most uh, quantum computers have in these days is this thing called the transmon qubit. It's, I think, the, the qubit of choice because it is really very simple to fab and very simple to operate and, and has really nice coherence times. All we're going to do here is to take one of those smaller Joseph's injunctions I showed you and shunt it with extra capacitance. And this extra capacitance is basically going to damp down the nonlinear circuit and damp it down until it's almost gone. And so then what we're going to get if we again expand this this series is that we can truncate we can ignore these sixth order and higher terms mostly without consequence and we're going to take these bottom terms and again use those raising and lowering operators to represent the Hamiltonian and find that we have a harmonic oscillator who now when I put extra photons into it has this number operator squared this fourth order term here what that does is if I look at the the potential energy and the spectrum of this of this qubit is to make the GE transition energy different from the EF transition energy by alpha, this parameter here in the circuit, and the same between F and H and H and higher. And so, for instance, you can build a 5 gigahertz qubit uh, whose next transition you need to avoid is 4.8 gigahertz, which is far enough away that we can selectively drive these bottom two levels and pretend the rest of the stuff isn't there and, and just use this as a qubit. In, in my laboratory where we build what are called 3D circuits, where our circuits are pretty big, 
uh, our transmons tend to look like two giant rectangles, which are forming this capacitance here. Then right here in the middle is too small to see is this tiny nanoscale Joseph Schwartz junction. And we make them these days either in aluminum or in my laboratory, mostly uh, tantalum for the big features. And then just only the small features are made out of aluminum. Okay, so that's sort of how you create a qubit. It's again an example of how we take a harmonic oscillator, we infect it with uh, nonlinearity to control it. The kind of controls we use in, in, in the research I'm showing you today are called parametric controls or parametric drives. And the problem with them is that this name, at least I personally find confusing, even though it's sort of been something I've worked on uh, for many, many years in the laboratory. So the example I'm going to give is of this uh, per person here on a swing. So a swing is a, a nonlinear oscillator. It's a pendulum. They have, just like the, the system I showed you before, a fourth order nonlinearity. And if I just sort of drive the swing from the outside, life is very simple. This is not parametric driving. In your undergraduate physics courses, this is called a damp-driven harmonic oscillator as long as we don't drive it too hard. And so we can just drive the system from the outside. This is not parametric. This is sort of the standard way you might drive a qubit or a cavity. Uh, and so what I'll start to say about parametric uh, pumps in the system is, is that what we're going to do is pump a parameter of the system. That's where this word parametric comes from, not the system directly. So I'm not going to do this. And the confusing thing, or one of the several about parametric uh, susceptibilities in the system is that they're often hidden unless you know how to look for them and how to grab hold of them. So you can have swing rides your whole life always being pushed by somebody else and you'll never be parametric. But then eventually, um, if you're a little bit of a daredevil like my children, you might stand up on the slide and you might start to realize that you can pump yourself up and down. And if you do this right, you'll find that now you have this alternate control knob on the system. Now you can take the moment of inertia of this system and you can modulate it in time. And so what used to be a fixed parameter now has a time dependence. And I don't want to belabor the math, but the idea is, again, that you're going to pump on a parameter, this thing that was maybe hidden in the sort of direct drive scenario. And now that control will allow you to manipulate the system and have uh, a lot of possibilities like I'll discuss today. So the way we do this uh, is a little bit more abstract looking. This is one of the other reasons parametric couplings are confusing. So what we really care about is not an explicit parameter, like let's say a capacitance or an inductance. We're just gonna look into the Hamiltonian and find for instance, that we would like some term that is phi A, the flux in some mode A times phi B times phi C. So we're gonna build some three mode coupler that generates this G tells us the magnitude of this coupling. And I'm gonna replace each of these fluxes through an inductor with their raising and lowering operators. And I'm gonna write out the Hamiltonian here, which has a lot, a lot of terms which we all describe as, as three wave or third order because they all have three raising and lowering operators in them. And what will happen here is that if A, B, and C are all at very different frequencies, none of these terms satisfy conservation of, of energy. And so they all just disappear. They all just die. They don't contribute to the dynamics of the system in the usual way. Unless you pick one of these modes, let's say mode C, and you drive it it cleverly, for instance, at the, the A plus B frequency. So if you have a 5 gigahertz A mode, a 7 gigahertz B mode, you pump at 12. As long as the C mode itself doesn't have a mode at 12 gigahertz, then you can do what's called the stiff pop approximation. And now what used to be this, this, this term in your Hamiltonian becomes uh, just a parameter. And you generate, in, in the case of, of uh, this first example here, by driving at the sum of the A and B modes, you generate a new two-body Hamiltonian which is lower order, and it has this term A dagger, B dagger, plus A, B. So what this means is that you're creating pairs of photons, one each in A and B, or you're annihilating pairs of photons in the system. And so this is a parametric drive that creates this parametric interaction, we would call it here, that you then use to build your system. Certainly in my laboratory and, and a bunch of others, these ideas really were, were developed for these things we call, for obvious reasons, parametric amplifiers. And this term here, I tend to default call a phase preserving gain or just gain term in my Hamiltonian. Because when I take two low Q cavities, couple them together with this term only, it generates phase preserving gain. So you can imagine doing this is exactly how we make many of the parametric amplifiers people use uh, in their circuits. There's a related one, a B dagger plus a dagger B. This one goes by several names, photon swapping, photon conversion. This one is interesting because it doesn't create or annihilate pairs of photons, it just moves them from place to place. 
it's not as useful a priori in a simple amplifier because it doesn't generate gain, uh, but it's actually going to be a key element of what I talk about today. And I should note that even though everything today is about superconducting circuits, this same physics occurs in optomechanics and diodes and optical fibers. Uh, anytime basically you can identify some, some nonlinearity in the circuit, you have this possibility. So it's really a very general technique. And so in our laboratory, uh, the sort of simplest examples we give of using these techniques, again, is to take two modes, A and B, in a system, connect them to microwave ports, apply this drive, and then what you're going to get, for instance, is a system where you apply a signal to mode A, it'll reflect with a, a, a voltage gain root G or a power gain G, and the same thing happens from port B, and if you put the circuit together and kind of look at it, you find that it has a reflection gain. Uh, which, for instance, is something like 20 dB, which is loud enough and, and quantum limited enough that this amplifier is, is, is uh, sort of the, the default thing that people go to for, for amplifying really weak microwave signals like those from qubits. And then you can take the same circuit and instead pump at the difference frequency, so omega A minus omega B. Was that a question, Slavko? Uh, if you entertain one about the swing, it, it, it came in a little bit late. I think some folks are delayed in the, in the feed. Okay. But... Um, I, I thought it's an interesting quick question to tackle. Something that always confused me when you are just sitting on the swing and driving in the normal way, kicking legs out and in, is that just standard non-parametric driving? <laughs> no, that's parametric too, because you're still changing your moment of inertia, aren't you? I picked the I standing on, so. okay, I picked the standing on the swing one because it's very clear to me that your, that your center mass is moving up and down. I feel like the other one is parametric, but um, mm, okay. Then now you I, make me nervous. So I think I'm a decline to <laughs> answer that question. <laughs> I know the reference that I took this picture from and cited considers that case also. Okay, awesome. I would think so because you know you, do other, you need an external drive. Where's the energy coming from? So, but you know it could be trickier. So. Well, this is again. This is like the one of the issues with parametric drives is like defining what they are. Um, okay, uh, okay, so moving on. So I have my Thank conversion. You. Yeah, no, <laughs> I, have, I have my conversion here. Um, this this is a weird use for your for your amplifier. It doesn't amplify anything, but you can kind of effectively make a system where light will flow in at five gigahertz. You can see that in reflection, the circuit is now matched. And so what you do is noiselessly convert a stream of five gigahertz light into an outgoing stream of let's say seven gigahertz light. Um, this is not maybe useful by itself. In fact, the modern amplifiers that, that we're trying to build in the laboratory con combine both of these processes together to really generate some neat dynamics. Uh, that's not the point of today's talk, except to say that, again, uh, you'll hear me use the words gain and conversion. These ideas came out of parametric amplification. And, and the big step for us in the laboratory was start to realize that this is really not what we needed to only use them for. So a natural question, though, to ask is, how do I make these third order terms in my superconducting circuit? So there's two, uh, there's actually like a, a family of circuits you can build. The two that we use in my laboratory, there's this thing called the shunted Josephson ring modulator. Um, this is like a bridge looking circuit. It has four nonlinear elements around the outside. These inner four elements here are to stabilize the flux response of the system. Maybe it doesn't look like it, it looks very symmetric, but when you apply a flux to the system, you break the symmetry and you generate this G A B C term where you have A plus A dagger, B plus B dagger, C plus C dagger. This is exactly that sort of ideal uh, three wave coupler that I talked about. It's really nice because it is rather ideal here, uh, but the microwave engineering of this circuit, which you see has three spatial modes, one where current goes left to right and top to bottom and this sort of in at the waist and out at the north and south pole, engineering microwave circuits which hook up to those three spatial modes can really be a headache. And so, uh, what we've been doing actually in the in the laboratory is to take this other thing, which is kind of a modified RF squid called a snail. Um, they wanted to call it a snail. I'm not sure this part is important. Uh, it has three big junctions on one side, one little one on the other. And what it does when you flux bias it, you see it kind of looks like a quarter of this circuit, is to take this element with just two attachment points and generate this S plus S dagger cubed Hamiltonian. So it's the same order but not nearly as, as clean as this one with three spatial modes. The advantage here is it just has two, two leads. You kind of plug and play with it. You say, I wish I had third order coupling here and you just graft it into the circuit. It does have this interesting consequence that when you hybridize it with another bunch of modes to build one of the systems I'll show you, 
it generates all the possible third order couplings. This can be a complication in your life. Maybe some of these you don't want. Maybe they're in the way spectrally or they, they're a problem in your circuit. Uh, but at least you see we can build these several different ways and even make some trade-offs about complexity of fabrication versus complexity of chemical. And so the, the the, the, the take home message, if we, if we get no further in the talk today than this, is that you can take that thing, you can build a parametric amplifier out of it by connecting two low Q cavities with strongly coupled ports, but you're really leaving a lot on the table. You're leaving a lot of meat on the bone if you do that. What my laboratory has really been expanding out into is to say, well, you can do most everything with these three wave parametric couplings. So uh, the thing I'm gonna tell you about in the majority of the talk today is this thing called a quantum state router where you, instead of connecting two high Q, uh, low Q modes, connect two high Q modes, and in fact, generate a network of all the all couplings. This is recently published on the archive. But in fact, you can build two qubit gates, which is something we're working on has already been published uh, in Japan, where they, you see they have something called a snail mod. Again, a three-wave parametric coupling, coupling two qubits together. You can do bath engineering. You can build masers where you control transmons via three-wave coupling. So really, you know, any two quantum objects you want to couple together, it seems that this technique can apply and, and can build some neat circuits. Um, so the, the, the meat of the talk now that I want to get into is this idea of building a modular quantum computer via these parametric couples. So here's uh, a comparison of, of two structures. So I'm going to define modular quantum computing by sort of defining it against what it isn't which is the surface code structure. So in this structure, which is, I think, used in most of the big machines people are building today, you couple a qubit to, let's say, four nearest neighbors. And this gives you a fabric of qubits that you make bigger by just expanding radially. And that's nice because you can just imagine adding rows and columns of qubits to get bigger. But it means that, for instance, if you have a qubit over here that needs to talk to a qubit over here, you have to swap information through the fabric with swap gates, and it takes many gates to link these two things that are far apart. And so what we want to build is something like a modular structure, which is even taking, let's say, pieces of this of this surface code and say, OK, when it becomes inconveniently large, let's put a thing on, on one side called a communication node. Let's imagine inside here we have all local, all to all operations. And then if I need to send light long distances, uh, I'm going to send it over this thing called a quantum state router. So that will transmit the light from this communication mode. And I can, for instance, get from here to here by first swapping communication mode over the router and then within the, the other module that I'm trying to move light around. In. There are a bunch of different ways to build these kinds of routers. Many of them in the optical regime uh, are quite lossy. And so you'll find that these protocols involving this, this, this modular quantum computing thing all involve measurement, all involve some kind of detection event because you have to combat the loss inside the router. The version that we're trying to build today is not really designed for long distances, but is designed for, let's say, flexibility. And so you can imagine that our router is not going to lose light as it passes through. In fact, you can think of this as just a way to build quantum gates between these communication modes that are uh, not talking to each other directly like they would be in the surface code. OK, so the advantage of this uh, is that you have shorter distance between arbitrary qubit pairs and that you can, for instance, run algorithms faster with less gates, especially in the, the noisy, flawed quantum computing era we're in right now, because there's just less steps along the chain that you have to walk to get from point A to point B. Um, so in this system, I want to revisit this idea of conversion one time and then just sort of try to give you a different picture of what it does. So it's the same underlying Hamiltonian. So if you look on the right-hand side of the slide, I have a three-body coupling. I'm going to drive the snail at the difference of two modes. These could be qubits. They could be cavities. Here, they're going to be cavities. Again, I drive at the difference. I get an effective two-body Hamiltonian, A dagger, B plus A, B dagger. The difference now is that this system is sealed. So the nice way to, to think about it is that like by an analogy on the left hand of the slide here, imagine that these two qubits were directly coupled to each other and they were on resonance. If you were to prepare, for instance, a photon in one of the two, then it would actually slosh back and forth. And if we stop here, this is a swap gate. This just swaps light from one mode to the next. If we stop in the middle, uh, this is called a root swap gate. It's the thing with when you do it twice, we'll swap light that tends to be a special entangling gate in the system. So, but the idea is just that the two qubits if, or cavities, if they're resonantly coupled, they'll just swap light back and forth. So I can build a swap gate in my system with the same thing I called conversion in, in my app. 
the, the nice thing about the parametric method is that when you turn off the drive, it really turns off. I don't have to move the frequency of the qubits around. And I have a very effective way for turning on and off this um, G2, we call it coupling between the two. If I want to build now my router, we're going to start uh, with a modest system. So we're going to say that this router should connect four different quantum modules together. So each of these square boxes here is a communication mode that's going to eventually be part of a quantum module. I have a central snail here to provide the three wave nonlinearity in the system. And so um, you'll notice in the rest of this that, that we're going to use modularity in two senses. One, we would like to build this network of dense couplings to build this modular network. But two, we really want, especially you know, in the laboratory uh, where everything is hand built by graduate students, it's going to be modular in the sense of it's built in pieces and I can put it together. And so when I look at my router, it actually is going to have four ancillary waveguide nodes in it. I've labeled them W1 through W4. And they're there so that the router is really a thing that exists independently of the modules I connect it to. There's another version of the story you could tell where you just build one monolithic uh, block system, which maybe would even have some advantages and simplicity, but it wouldn't have the modularity we're looking for, which as I'll show you means that we really can take apart parts of the system without throwing the whole thing away and fabbing again from scratch. So there's these four helper modes here. Nothing is on resonance with anything else quite deliberately. And so what happens is all of these couplings are what are called dispersive, which means these things influence each other, but they don't uh, exchange light directly. The, the consequence of this is that, for instance, the self third order, the G, what we call triple S, the third order nonlinear, the snail, gets kind of diluted and spread across the system. And so you can imagine that there is a third order coupling between, for instance, cavity one here and cavity two here. But all of these dispersive coupling factors, G over delta, which are all around 0.1 in our system, act to, to reduce this coupling. So we start from a moderately strong G triple S of the snail itself, but now we sort of really knock down the, the effective third order in, in the system. And this is the sort of price of building these dispersive couplings. The advantage is we don't have to match anything. We don't have to be particularly careful. It's designed to be easy to miss and screw up a little and still have the system work. And the other key feature here is because I apply this external microwave drive, if my third order coupling is smaller, I just drive harder. And in fact, we uh, in, in amplifier systems make really quite large uh, effective two body couplings from really quite small three bodies. So I really can get away with this trick. And so just to show you the links in the system, these yellow links represent the snail to the waveguide. These blue links represent the waveguide to the cavity. And now hereafter, uh, you can kind of just imagine the waveguide modes don't exist. They're there, I'm never gonna drive them, I'm never gonna populate them, but they exist to sort of create this network of third order couplings um, in my system. And so uh, then I can then operate the, the the machine. The other advantage here of these helper modes, by the way, is that I don't want the router to have to be built out of things that are as high quality as qubits. It's really nice if the router itself can be built out of lower Q uh, objects, especially the snail, which I want to be really easy to drive and really easy to access. And so um, what I've written here is that the communication modes here at the outside can be very long, even though the snail here at the middle is not uh, particularly long -lived. So this is what the router itself looks like. I've kind of cut it off a corner here. You see a snail living in a waveguide. Yeah. On the last slide, uh, just yeah. maybe I missed it, but what's delta omega, delta w sub i c sub i? What's c, what are those two? Right, so that so uh, this g over delta is, so each of these couplings has a g, which is the, the direct coupling they would have if they're on resonance. Delta is just the frequency difference. And so the, the net dispersive coupling, how much uh, of this third order coupling they inherit is just the product of all of the G over deltas in the system. Yeah, I, I think I meant the one that each cavity mode frequency is shifted by this, this, this. So uh, I think on this, on this system here, maybe. Uh, okay. It's easier to see. So, so each cavity mode is nearby a waveguide helper mode. So that Delta is like 50 to hundred megahertz. Uh, so we don't try to match them like sub megahertz, but we park them, let's say, 100 megahertz away from each other. So they inherit this G over delta of 0.1. So here are the four high Q cavity modes. Here are the four medium Q waveguide helper modes. Here's the very low Q snail. 
and now all the drives in the system are differences of the cavity nodes. And so what happens in the system is that as long as the six potential parametric couplings all have different frequencies, different frequencies I need to drive at, I have this one uh, microwave port here connected to the system. I drive the snail at one or even some combination of these six frequencies, and that generates a network of parametric couplings as if all of these cavity modes were talking directly to each other. And again, uh, the advantages of, of the particular way of engineered this, it's modular. This is really, an, this is a, a 3D graphic. You'll see the real thing in a second. Uh, I can plug in and unplug different modules on the side. I can change out the character of the modules. If the router breaks, I can fix the router. Um, all of the detunings can miss by something like 10 megahertz, which uh, for those of you who built super detecting systems, it's nice to be able to miss your target frequencies somewhat. And the other neat thing we've done here is that all of the difference frequencies are below any mode of the system. So none of my pumps collide with a mode. And in fact, the way we operate this thing is that this drive port has a really strong low pass filter. So we've kind of built a greenhouse. None of the system is really meant to be accessed through this port resonantly. The only access I have is, is at very low frequencies. And so we can parametrically drive the system really long, but we don't have a strong coupling for light to leak out of the system at any of the modes we care about. So it's really like a, a greenhouse to help protect these systems from losses due to the very strong pumping. Okay, um, this is a picture of the real device. So here you see this long piece of waveguide. It has a magnet on the top to bias the snail. It has a port running through the bottom. The snail is mounted on a sapphire chip here. You see this modularity I talked about. Here's four quantum modules. Uh, right now you can think of them just as communication modes for this first experiment. The whole thing bolts together with lots of brass bolts and molybdenum washers. Uh, we put it in the fridge. What you're meant to think about this as is again, four modules that share all to all couplings. So this quantum state router can move light from any module to any module uh, in one step via these three-way parametric drives. And uh, how important is uh, the bolting, the interface basically, you know, uh, how important is that? Uh, and, uh, it is it's very important and I'll, um, I'll tell you that this is the, we call this in the lab tree 1.0. This is our first prototype. Um, it has, if you look back at this picture, you see it has like very fancy shapes and it has indium seals and a lot of things we did that we thought were right. Uh, uh -huh. It turns out they're basically all wrong. Um, <laughs> so I'll show you, I'm gonna tell you how we operated tree 1.0. Um, the questions you're gonna ask about like how the lifetimes are influenced by bolting things together are very important. And at the end, unfortunately, the data on tree 2.0 is not complete yet, but I'll show you how we actually fix that in the follow on design. Okay, very nice. So uh, for now, just set that one in, in the side of your brain and we'll answer it in a little bit. Awesome. Okay, so we built this thing, we put it together. There are four communication modes. They live 20 or 30 microseconds. These are really not great times uh, because this was our first prototype. Um, but what I can do now is to take this system I can, for instance, displace cavity four through a weakly coupled port I've attached to it to create a coherent state in that system. I can turn on the swap drive by driving nearly at the difference frequency. There's some small AC start shifts we have to take into account. And then what I can do now is through the weakly coupled ports that I've tied to these four cavities, just wash the light slosh back and forth coherently inside the system via the sort of small fraction of it that leaks out. And this is what it looks like. So this is preparing light in cavity four, it sloshes to cavity two, and you see that this red, white, blue, white, red kind of pattern is coherent states moving back and forth from cavity four, and the complementary thing 90 degrees shifted is that light showing up in cavity two. There's a coherence process, they move back and forth with a definite phase, which you can see by this white stripe in, in cavity four, and this white feature in the off quadratures of these other two cavities. So it really does move with, from one quadrature to the other with a phase I control with the microwave pump. Great. And just to clarify, these are uh, these are coherent states you're moving back and forth of some amplitude. Yeah, that's right. These are couple photon coherent states that I'm moving back and forth of and I'm measuring with, uh, you know, I'm measuring the voltage. I'm not doing any photon counting or anything. So these are yeah. all sort of very semi-classical looking signals. Uh, but nonetheless, if I plot this voltage as a function of time that I'm receiving room temperature, I see that I just get the hybrid lifetime of the system. So this means that, that I'm not, for instance, one problem you could have is if you drive this pump very strong, the qubits live, or in this case, the cavities live not very long. You would swap very quickly, 
but you wouldn't get a very high fidelity operation because you'd be damping the light as you swap it back and forth. So the fact that this swaps the light in a few hundred nanoseconds, but I see that the lifetime hasn't changed, tells me that I really am just moving the light back and forth and nothing um, you know, bad is happening in the process. Awesome. Yeah. Um, could you say more about the lifetimes? Like, what were those cavity lifetimes? Yeah. So the cavity lifetimes in this system are are in the vicinity of twenty microseconds. Okay. Well, why why are they not uh, you know um, a millisecond? <laughs> well, yeah. So these are um, this is one legacy of the COVID. So these are the first like attempts we ever made at high Q cavities, and they're all made in uh, sixty sixty one aluminum, and um, we never sort of got a second chance at making these things. So we made the first set, they weren't great. Um, okay. The new ones I'll show you at the end are several hundred microseconds. Um, they're still not 60, uh, they're still not milliseconds and they're still not acid etched high purity aluminum because that stuff is a pain. Uh, but you know, this is one of those things where if you had infinite machine shop time, we would have just grabbed <laughs> uh, another set, but we wanted to know whether it worked, right? Got it. Awesome. So we yeah, just yeah. moved on from this. Makes sense. And can you say more about the <laughs> the cavity lifetime as a function of the pumps? Yeah, yeah. So in this case, it's not a function of the pumps here, right? So I apply these strong pumps. I move the light back and forth. If the cavity starts to to to, to shorten its lifetime, then I you know I stop going faster because my fidelity will no longer improve of this swap operation. Uh, yeah. What what sets the rate limit on your? I guess here your swap is a couple of right. seconds. So uh, no, this one I think is, um, oh, okay. So you see here, here are all the, the full swap times for the system. So the slowest oh, one is okay. one microsecond. The fastest one is 300 nanoseconds. I think the average is uh, six or 700. Mm -hmm. um, so there are a number of things that, that, that set this. The G over deltas, if they're not quite right, some of these cavities are just a little hard to talk to. And so what can happen is you can run out of room temperature power. Mm -hmm. Or you can put a big amplifier at room temperature and you can start to melt the fridge if the drive is too strong. <laughs> or it is true that like um, if, for instance, your waveguide and your cavity mode have missed kind of close together, you can start to put light in the waveguide where it'll die very rapidly. Or, you know, other multi what we would call multi parametric physics can happen where you accidentally start to uh, have some unwanted parametric coupling or some unwanted. Uh, mm -hmm swap so there are six swaps here i want to emphasize they all work which is really awesome. awesome they don't all necessarily have the exact same speed limit and one of the things i'll show you in my conclusion is really understanding better these speed limits you know not in an amplifier system but in this in this coherent quantum system is one of the things we really want to learn more about gotcha uh so i guess you'll talk about later what the dominant mechanism is if there is one dominant one there, there isn't, as far as I understand, one dominant one. Uh, there's, there's an easy dominant one, which is you put too much attenuation in your fridge line and then you just run out of power. <laughs> Obviously, we have yanked out enough attenuators for that not to be the case. And then, you know, um, it would be a simpler story if they're all limited by the same thing, but I really can't say that right now. Okay, well, that, that's, that's good. That's interesting. And uh, heating of the fridge, is that an issue at all? Or? So the way the system is designed to operate right now, which is with this big low pass filter and very little attenuation, this is, I think, not a problem. Um, when we used to, you know, when we started and had, I don't know, 30 dB attenuation, 40 dB attenuation at base, yeah, it definitely can be a problem. But as I'll show you, I have a little sort of uh, mini piece I'm adding on the end of this talk. Um, this is not just a problem for parametric drives, it's just a generic problem for driving quantum coherent systems that if you start to heat your you know, your attenuators and stuff, you can run into problems. Okay, so this is swapping coherent states. This is semi-classical, it's all to all, it works really nicely. So now we wanna go back and do this in a more quantum way. So the, the modules here are the dead simplest thing we could get away with. So here's the communication mode. We're gonna add one transmon qubit dispersively coupled to the cavity. Oops. We're gonna add one readout cavity that reads out the transmon. Again, another dispersive coupling here. You see the round ones are the readout ones, the square ones are the communication ones. There's a hole drilled in the wall here and long sapphire chips that mount the transmon at the interface between the two. Um, and then we're actually going to use an older parametric technique, a four-wave coupling um, between the two to again generate interactions between them. And, and this, I have to admit, so I'll show you, you know, this is somewhere we, we really want to improve, uh, building cooler quantum modules. But here the goal was to make the router work, so we built the simplest thing we could get away with that we thought would work. 
So now in the experiment, we put in these three qubits that I'm showing here schematically. We cool the same system back down. Again, it's nicely modular in that I can add and remove qubits to the modules without having to remake everything. And now we're going to redo the same experiment, but now with Fox states. So now we'll generate a photon in this qubit. We'll do an intra-module swap from Q2 to C2. Now the router swap, which is really our focus. And in the end, we'll either swap C4 over to Q4 or we'll swap C2 back to Q2 to complete the protocol here. It's shown in time. And then now we're going to see the same kind of features we saw before, but instead of uh, swapping coherent states back and forth and monitoring them uh, continuously, this is single shot qubit readout. And you see again the qubit moving back and forth between Q2 and Q4 here. If I run this for a while, I can show you how this uh, both swaps and decays. I can simulate uh, in these dotted lines with the master equation to see what's going on here. We see pretty good uh, behaviors at this, this rate, which again, is, it looks like it's around, I don't know, four or 500 nanoseconds for a full swap. And the lifetime of the system, so the qubits are like something like, I don't know, 10 microseconds. They're really not great. Um, but the router, in fact, works very well. The router swap fidelity is 97%. The reason this transfer fidelity is only something like 73% is because of both these four-wave swaps, which are not the best, and the lifetime of the qubits. Basically, uh, the qubits tend to kill which fraction of the light they're holding on to. Mm. Uh, and uh, the red transmon that's in the middle of, of the router, how much? That's a snail. Or right. Snail. So this is a snail. Yeah, so this, you can think of this. It's not a. So that it's really not a, a qubit. It is a very low Q mode, like a few thousand, maybe maybe ten thousand. I don't know, hundred thousand max, with ideally no fourth order term and only a third order term. So it's really like kind of a little mini parametric amplifier hidden in the middle of the system. It's not a qubit. Okay. Okay. So it's it's a mode that just has that third order nonlinearity, and maybe it has some cur, but not too much cur. Maybe. Uh, it turns out when you drive these systems hard, they have these things we call dynamic curves, which also show up in amplifiers. Uh, the dynamic curve effects are probably even more important than the straight curve effects. Yeah. Okay. okay. And it and the waveguide modes, they never appear on my pulse diagrams because I never drive them. I never put light in them. They exist again to create this susceptibility, which I then directly access. And uh, what what would happen if a thermal photon entered the the red mode? Would that totally so, scrub the protocol, or would it? Would it so no, I, I. So it would move the snail. To the extent that the snail has a cross curve to the waveguide, it would move the waveguide. To the extent that the waveguide has a cross curve with the cavity, it would move the cavity. But since there's this long chain here, and the curves are meant to be small. I really don't think it's going to have like a big, for instance, dephasing effect or even something that we could easily measure. Okay, so maybe not a phasing, and would it would I guess hit the transfer fidelity to some extent, but maybe you're saying it's not a big deal. Well, the it's a good question. That you know, a, a resonant photon in the system uh, would, at fifth order, modulate the third order coupling strength. Um, but then that's again going to depend on the fifth order versus third order, and um, so the so the, the you know we to the best extent we can we we try to be robust against the snail. You're right that like all of these things have effects at some level, and maybe we're going to discover that some of our problems are due to like hot snails or something like this. Uh, <laughs> but it's 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 really just meant to sit there cold and only be stiffly pumped. So that's kind of the advantage here is we've really tried to make ourselves that it can have a short lifetime, and be a rather imperfect object that we still have good controls from. Gotcha. Okay, so for now we can assume the hot snail is not a problem, <laughs> or yeah, it's a cool yeah. snail. <laughs> right. Um, and so the the next thing we can do in the system is really try to do something um, quantum mechanic and fun. So if we've generated Fox state transfers, now we need to create Bell states. Again, here the protocol is we prepare the qubits in the ground state via measurement. We excite one. We do one of these root swap operations I showed you before. Um, there's a little bit of nomenclature issue here. A swap is really easy to define for two qubits. You see these are swaps between qubits and cavities. Um, there are some like slight wrinkles in these definitions, but because the targets are all empty and because of the kind of swaps that I'm choosing here, you really can think of these as this is the root swap gate, swap gate, swap gate. So I generate at this point a bell pair where half is in a communication mode. Then I move it to the other communication mode. I move it to the other qubit. And in the end, uh, these two communication modes should be empty. I do tomography of the qubits. 
this is all single shot tomography. I've applied no corrections for uh, infidelity of measurement. So there, we're taking a little bit of a hit here. But you see that the three qubits I put in the system, I can create bell pairs among all of them. And again, the difference in like bell fair fidelity here, I think is that, was it qubit three is the worst qubit? So um, again, when I simulate based on just the lifetimes of all of these modes and all of the time it takes to do all these swaps, which I think is about two microseconds, um, you know, I get pretty decent agreement, at least in terms of the fidelity here. And the problem is just that even though these, these times are not bad, uh, the qubits and cavities just need to live a really long time. It needs to be more coherent to really get full, uh, full bang for my buck out of the system. And so, uh, you know, we of course have to push it even further. So now we try to generate uh, full entanglement. We do root swaps, full swaps. It turns out we figured out how to make a C knot between the qubits and the cavities. Again, it's, it's you know, a lot of details here. What I'll say is this stuff on the left generates a GHZ state, but part of the GHD lives in a cavity. So the rest of the sequence then is taking the part of the GHD state that doesn't live in a qubit and moving it over to a qubit where I can measure it. And here's kind of where we hit the limit of the system. So this is not provable entanglement. Um, and again, the problem here is just that we need longer coherence qubits. We need longer coherence cavities. The, I think the gate times of a few hundred nanoseconds are pretty good. We don't need that to get hugely better. Uh, but as you asked, Slavko, you know, it would be better if this was a millisecond, right? But we've built this system. It has all-to-all -all coupling. We can move among four modules. You know, it's modular. If you had a good module to give me, as long as the cavity frequency matches, we can just plug it onto the side. It's really agnostic about what the, the router is uh, coupling. And one of the reasons we use coherent state, uh, sorry, we use cavities for the communication modes explicitly instead of, let's say, communication qubits is that we'd like to be able to, for instance, if you have cat states, if you have GKP states, binomial states, you know, the router can support swapping those also. So it's really meant to be pretty flexible. Okay, so conclusion number one, uh, is, you know, this works and exactly what we need to do is improve the coherence and figure out how to build bigger systems. So here now, Zlako is your answer. So the new one is all mirror polished. So you see there's a quarter getting reflected in the side. The walls are all dead flat and there's no indium anywhere. Uh, so this is, there, there's no indium, you said? No indium anywhere. We don't use indium anywhere in our fridge anymore. What's the motivation? <laughs> because it turns out when we did a bunch of testing that two mirror polished superconductors joined together makes way better contact than anything with indium in between. Huh. So now you'll see uh, in the first design, we worked really hard to build it out of one monolithic piece of uh, aluminum. Yeah. In the new design, you see it's cut in half pretty much down the middle. There's yeah. a very beautiful mirror polished seam here, but these waveguide modes went from living sub microsecond to living, uh, I think the longest one lived like 400 microseconds now. Hmm. And this is all in 6061 aluminum, and the trick to all of this stuff is really the polishing and preparation of the surfaces. You know, there's there's work out of Rob Sholkoff's group that really points the way to this, but it just turns out that when you put things together with sort of rough machine surfaces, you get a, a quality of the seam that's way lower than you, you would really expect it to be. And you do something hmm. like a thousand times better, a hundred to a thousand times better just by mirror polishing everything. So. It makes for prettier pictures because everything is beautiful now. You can see your face in the cupid. Uh, but that's really, so now everything in this new system has over 100 microseconds. You'll also notice that we pulled the snail out into a tube so that we can give strong couplings to it and flux bias to it without sticking big pieces of copper into the waveguide. And that's mm -hmm. also allowing us to increase our coupling. And, and in general, it turns out the snail in the tube with sort of one antenna sticking out is just more flexible. Mm. So the um, snail just protrudes into uh yeah that's right so it's it's actual snail is living under this magnet back inside this copper element uh -huh. and then its antenna sticks out but now all the coupling and flux control is handled in the tube so none of those elements like impose losses on the waveguide system here gotcha so what do you simulate that with to understand it well this is i mean the simulations are all hfss uh there are ways to do seam simulations in HFSS, but the biggest set of things was just we polished a lot of the cavities with various different ways and kept cooling them down and checking out the lifetimes. So um, if you build a shoebox cavity like this one and you put the seam at the roof where it's most destructive, 
uh, we would actually find things like in some of these systems, if you had raw joints, it didn't actually get higher Q when you cooled it down. Mm. So even though it was a superconductor, its Q stayed, let's say 10,000, because the seam was so lossy that it dominated the whole system. So, mm. so both aesthetically pleasing uh, and, and scientifically important. And you see here, this is what you need to access, right? So if we want to change out a quantum module here, as long as it has a flat wall and an aperture that matches this so size, we can just plug it on and use the existing router. Mm -hmm. So sure. we've made a lot of progress here. Um, there's still some questions about the snail and the speed limit of the snail and how to like optimize, let's say the snail to get really fast gates and not poison the lifetimes of anything else in the system. That's really ongoing research. Uh, but now, you know, we, we at least know that in these platforms, we can, we can get the lifetimes up. It's not that we're really stuck. And uh, if we like, we're targeting 100 nanoseconds down from a few hundred nanoseconds in the next generation. If the lifetimes stay 100 like they are right now, then we're talking about three nine gates over the router. So really a very coherent operation uh, of this object. Mm. The and, other uh, piece, oh, go ahead. Oh yeah, a quick two question. So this is just mirror polish and some basic like acid edge or not, not even? No, this is 6061 aluminum. Uh, it doesn't like getting dipped in acid. So yeah. like, um, like I mean, you could like ask me later, you know, th this is questions about like, uh, what kind of sandpaper we use. Okay. <laughs> you know, uh, this is all mechanically polished, no chemical treatment except for soapy water. Cool. Yeah. Nice. It probably again would be better when we transition over to, uh, acid etched aluminum, um, and that's something we're looking at. We just haven't gotten that far. And you know, um, since the system has, I forget, 16 modes we care about, it's very complicated to build. If we can get away with 6061, so at least we don't accidentally like cave in the walls, bolting stuff together, we'd really like to stay there. Gotcha, awesome, okay. So the other piece, so if my theme is you should do everything with three wave control, I showed you that the module was running on four wave parametric operations. So the, the other thing we're doing is to say, well, let's build parametrically controlled modules. So this is maybe a little bit hard to look at picture. It's four transmons living in tubes with readout modes. It's one snail in the middle. It's like the same idea as the router rebuilt with qubits instead of communication modes. And so this is then gonna, if you imagine have all to all three way parametric controls between qubits, we probably need to put a communication mode on one end, plug it into the end of this. And then you have four modules, let's say with four qubits. Now that's a 16 qubit machine. And so that's the first prototype is, is in the laboratory. I didn't show a real picture because it just looks like a block of aluminum, but uh, we're working on these and we we're gonna bring a talk to this on the March meeting. And then there's like bigger questions, which is this is four modules. How do we connect 12 modules? How do we connect 16 modules? We've, we've simulated at least in HFSS that if you can make a snail that lives with one foot in, in two of these module elements, for instance, we can hook together 12 modules and we can have multiple parametric couplings available like simultaneously between the modules. So now you can imagine we can build a line, we can build kind of a pyramid, we can build some kind of hierarchical, bigger uh, quantum system. So that's really exciting. Um, we're trying to figure out, you know, what are the network geometries that we can build? What are the ones that are powerful for computing? As we talked about before, what are the speed limit, fidelity limit for our gates? And, and uh, the last piece, which I guess, I still have a few more minutes, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the last piece, uh, which I wanna show you kind of is a little bit of a step sideways from modular quantum computers, but really in this theme of what else can you do with parametric controls? Because when you have one of these standard transmons in a tube that are uh, sort of the basis of many experiments these days, it's got some readout mode. This is all very standard, nothing special here. Um, we're always looking for longer T1s of the transmon. And so the, one of the things you have to do to have a longer T1 is pull this drive pin back, is to make this Q higher here, which means that you have a weaker drive coupling, which means you need uh, often also more filtering, but then now you still have to drive the qubit. So now you apply more power, you, you have potentially cryo heating of the drive chain. And, and we looked at these problems and we looked at the parametric systems we we're building. And so the basic question is like, do I really have to do this? Can I can I just use a parametric control for the transmon? Instead of driving it resonantly, is there some other trick I can play here based on this sort of generic Hamiltonian? 
And the answer is yes, and it lies exactly in this fourth order term here. I've written it in the suggestive way of a dagger plus a to the fourth, because it turns out, again, there are a lot of terms here that die in the rotating wave. And when I grab the right one, I can rebuild the system just slightly, where now uh, I can drive the system at about a third of the frequency. And two things happen when I drive strongly at a third of the trans one frequency. One is that I, 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 I AC start shift the qubit. I shift its frequency over in a way that depends quadratically on how hard I drive. But now I get a Robbie rate. I can directly drive the qubit using these three photons to act together in a way that scales with the voltage cube that I apply. And this is compared to uh, linearly scaling in voltage for the sort of direct drive, this one I've drawn here in blue. And so what we did here, the rule we set ourselves, we didn't engineer the qubit specially at all. We just took a generic one lying around because we wanted to prove that this was true for sort of any transmon we looked at. Um, and all we did was again, take this trick. We put a low pass filter here. So now I can access the drive frequency, which was one third of the qubit, but now the qubit is protected and the resonator is protected. In fact, this line is, is doing a really good job of in improving T1 because I can just again, create a greenhouse. This looks just like the drives we were applying before. The only wrinkle here is that this is a four wave couple, not a three wave coupling. And so we wanted to know, does that really work? And so here's sort of a, a qubit we picked in the laboratory. And you see here, this is time, this is detuning. I'm pumping harder and harder. So these are fixed voltage variable time Robbie flops. And what you see that as I drive harder and harder and harder and harder, the system oscillates really much faster. You see, this is 40 microseconds. This is 400 nanoseconds with these square top pulses. And what you find is that if I define the start shift of the qubit, again, you see that it's shifting downwards quadratically with the drive voltage I apply. But now the Robbie rate goes as the voltage cubed. And so this is really neat because when I just increase the drive voltage a little bit more, I get a vastly higher Robbie rate for the system. And, and in fact, it works. The parametric, the, the, the qubit drive itself is something that we can do parametrically. And, and all of this data you know, is from a qubit where we didn't even have resonant access. We did all of the spectroscopy, the tune-up, the alignment, you know, completely with these, what we're calling subharmonic pulses. And, and just like in the, the parametric controls we use in the router, we don't see uh, at the, any of these rates here, any lifetime degradation. And in fact, we wanted to, to put a number on it. Say, are these you know, good, uh, meaningfully good? And in fact, uh, the pi pulses and the pi over two pulses that we measure due to interleaved randomized benchmarking are between 994 and something like uh, 40 nanosecond pulses, so pretty standard from something we would do in our lab. And this number is pretty standard, just nothing really other than needed to predict it other than the, the T2 uh, of the qubit. And again, uh, to anticipate Zlako's question, right, this is not the world's best qubit. And so the, the sort of the little final piece here is to say, you know, you see that we're building modules. You see that we're building routers. We can try to understand how we use these three wave couplings to put these big quantum machines together. But maybe we can use these for even more exotic things. Maybe we can build qubits that don't need resonant access. Maybe we can build longer qubits this way because we can filter the resonant frequency very strongly while still retaining the ability to do rapid uh, qubit pulses. And this again, I know it's a little bit of a step sideways, but it's the exact same idea just applied to sort of a slightly different problem. Uh, I think I'm, I'm at the end of my time here. I want to stop by thanking all of the laboratory. Here you see us all standing outside uh, Sunny Pit campus. I want to point out Ming Kang Jia did the data for the snail module and the subharmonic driving and the tree, that quantum computer is really the, the, the passion of Pin Lei Lu and, and Chao Zhou. Uh, thank you very much and I'll take whatever else questions people have. Thank you, Michael, for the awesome talk. Um... I think you're one of our few speakers that finished exactly at the dot of the hour. So <laughs> <laughs> kudos to that, even with many questions. Uh, we do have a few more questions. Here's a quick one from the audience. Do you choose the cavity modes to minimize seam loss as well when you were talking about the block? Uh... Yeah, um, so the, the thickness of the wall here matters for seam loss. And I think we've mostly end up the seam wall the walls are rather thick because they have to be thick enough to slide these screws into them and so at least we don't see at the like whatever 100 200 microsecond level that those seams are particularly important because uh again the light is not very good at going through these it looks like a big hole uh to your eyes but if you're a five gigahertz photon you don't really want to go down it so i think these seams are way less important than this big seam here 
which has got you know all of these waveguides living in it, and this scene here, which has a snail crossing it. I I, I can't see where you're pointing. Sorry, it's so, so the, the the scene here where the copper joins the aluminum uh -huh. is way more important because it has the snail crossing it. So gotcha. the snail focuses a lot of you know fields in the vicinity of that seam. So the seams we worry about are this one number one, this one number two, and these ones are kind of down the list. Got it. Um, okay, awesome. And a uh, couple of questions. So there was a question earlier from the audience about the crosstalk in, I think, the two qubit uh, uh, operations in the router. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't know if you've gotten that far uh, to to measure it, look at some of that. So if I drive, if I do an interaction between qubits one and two, how much does, if, does that affect some information stored in qubit three or vice versa? So we, um, I guess I didn't show the data. Um, so we have done a couple experiments on this. So I guess one thing I forgot to say in my excitement, um, you can actually run multiple of these swaps in parallel. And you can do what are called V-shaped swaps where you swap from one source to two targets, or you can just do parallel operation. And so the experiment we did to check crosstalk is to actually run one swap by itself or to run another swap in parallel. And we see, as far as we can tell from the data, that the two swaps just ignore each other and run in parallel. There's a question, uh, it's not a crosstalk exactly, but um, when we drive both things in, in, in parallel, we sometimes find that we have to, or I guess we often find that we have to reduce the speed of the swap. Because maybe, for instance, our snail cannot support two intense pumps at the same time. So it really goes back to this question of like speed and fidelity limits here. So um, we don't see that they interfere with each other, but it is true that, for instance, we can't run everything in parallel right now in the system at full speed. Yeah, that's really so. Maybe to piggyback off of that, you said that we don't. It doesn't yet appear that there's one chief limiting mechanism to you know the speeds and fidelities and all that. But what would be sort of the, some of the main immediate things to think about? Sure. So like an easy one is like if you exceed the critical current T1, of the snail. <laughs> no, oh, well, okay. no, no, no. The T1, T2 are the symptom, right? But if you drive the snail so hard that you exceed its critical current, its Q will go, you know, way, way down. I don't know, five, four, whatever. When the snail is four, and even though the, the, the cavities can live 10,000 times larger, uh, longer, you know, so you can really poison the whole system if you punch the snail out of the well. Um, the other thing is the, I told you, I think there's, oh, let's see, there's three modes we care about explicitly per module. So that's 12, there's four here plus the snail. So that's 17 modes we care about. But of course there's way more modes in the system. So, you know, if you're the highest cavity and I'm swapping you to the lowest cavity, I have to make sure that there's also not some mode in the system that's equal, like, so that that's a three gigahertz difference. I have to worry about what's three gigahertz above the top cavity, right? So I can accidentally have a wrong target mode. So, so I really need to care about not just the, the 17 modes I care about, but a bunch of other modes in the system, the higher harmonics of the communication cavities, the higher harmonics of the waveguide, um, to make sure that I don't accidentally start to target those. And because they're low Q, in general, the higher frequency we go, the lower the Q. They tend to be, let's say, broader targets. I also have, um, one of the neat things about this subharmonic drive involves three pump photons, right? And it works perfectly nice. So it shows me that I can do swaps with one and two and three pump photons. But now when you go back to the router, it also means that you can active, dense, accidentally activate processes with one and two and three pump photons which means now we're also worried about fifth order couplings in the system and which collisions among fifth order couplings might resemble collisions among third order couplings, right? So, so I would say that the sort of frequency management and the, like just driving the snail harder than it can tolerate are my two biggest fears at the moment that we're working on. Okay. Awesome. And, um, on the subharmonic driving, that's really, but, well, first of all, it's really awesome. You can drive things at once. I mean, that, that seems like a really awesome potential capability and feature. On the subharmonic driving, um, you now have this cubic dependence, which and, and, you know, shows very nice results. Um, what about the concern about fluctuations on the amplitude of the drive? Uh, and doesn't this make 
this more susceptible to time variations and drift? Sure. And so, 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 so since it's a third order process, you're three times more sensitive to like amplitude instability. Um, but I guess uh, certainly at the three nines level, I don't think amplitude instability is our least, uh, or sorry, is the thing we're most afraid of, right? So it, it's, it is transferring part of the problem into like the RF chain and your ability to apply good pulses. Um, but at least, you know, I'm not aware that that's like a limitation we're going to hit. Uh, or at least, you know, I'm not going to hit it that much differently, right? I'm going to hit it within the same order of magnitude that you would have hit it with a standard drive. Okay. Yeah. It, is you, true, you, mm -hmm. it is true that generically, you know, uh, when we start to do higher fidelity gates in the router, in the subharmonics, you, you know, you try to make things that have three nines in them. You suddenly find air conditioner cycles, you know, like temperature fluctuation cycle. You definitely find all these things in your system, right? But even though, you know, the two things or one is a third order parametric pumping process, the one is, is linear in the pump, the, they're only factor of three off. So those problems seem to be generic, like stabilizing your, stabilizing your system problems, not specific ones to this. Like if you asked me like, or I could ask you, Zlatko, like when you guys start having IBM qubits with 10 to the minus four fidelity, I would imagine that that's not that easy to get in your drive chain, right? Yeah, I, like you said, it, it takes like all the way from the bottom of the fridge all the way through all the electronics. It's, right. It gets but, so I think that part is scarier to me than the factor of three from this one. Yeah. Okay. No, that makes sense. Awesome. And um, can you tell us a little bit more about the simulations that you do for these and how much do you have to simulate the cavities, the nonlinearities, um, to use any like open source packages, things like that? So we do all this in Qtip. And um, actually, it's really hard to, the a naive a priori thing is that you would just write your full Hamiltonian in it, you would take no truncations, then you would just simulate the system, right? But that doesn't work. Uh, that's, that's too many modes, that's too many details. So the simulations here, like the ones that produce these curves. Um, so what we did there is assume that there's a G2 we can turn on as a function of time. So we put in here all the modes. So there's only one photon in the system. So it's two cavities and two qubits and maybe three or four photons each, right? Mm -hmm. The snail and the parametric part don't exist explicitly in the simulations. We just say, here's a G2 of T. And we turn it on with the envelopes that follow these things. Mm -hmm. So um, that could certainly be more realistic, uh, but that, you know, it runs into problems like why pair amps, for instance, are not very easy to simulate. Uh, in a quantum way is that, you know, notionally we'd want to put lots of photons into this snail degree of freedom. We'd like to write the untruncated Hamiltonian, not take the rotating wave. Uh, but I think, you know, that's, at least we're not experts enough to make that easy to do. Gotcha. And what about the, um, the simulations open source analysis on the ENM side to the quantum bridge? Yeah. Uh, you mean like how we make this stuff? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is all Python code living on top of HFSS. Okay. Oh, I, I accept, I accept um, to, to speak maybe to your interest, I do think we use EPR on the transmons. Okay, yeah, cool. That's... So we, I think we use black box and EPR, uh, you know, to get those G over deltas basically. Okay, nice. Yeah, I think I'd seen some Pi PR um, issues or polls uh, from from Hat Lab. So, I yeah, <laughs> that's right. They do definitely enjoy working. My students definitely prefer working in the eigen mode basis instead of the driven mode. Right. Um, that's really nice. Cool. Yeah, that's that's pretty neat to hear. Awesome. Well, folks, if you have any final questions, um, now's the time to post them. Uh, otherwise, Michael, I'll let you say any final words or messages you'd like to share with uh, the audience before we. Thank well, you. I guess I should say, um, if you want to know more, visit us at hatlab.pit.edu. Uh, we are definitely always hiring. And uh, thank you very much for joining me today. <clears throat> All right. Thank you, Michael. And thank you, folks, for uh, thank you, folks, for tuning in. And thank you very much, Michael, for the wonderful talk and for accepting our invitation. It was a real pleasure to see you again and uh, to hear the latest on your results. Uh, I, I, actually, I think they're really awesome. 
So the fact that I'm asking, you know, what are the limitations is is more <laughs> of a reflection of trying to push to the next thing instead of uh, yeah, a reflection yeah. on the results in that way. No, no. Uh, I think they're really awesome. Uh, thank you, folks, for tuning in. Thanks, Michael. And I think with that, we will see you next Friday at noon Eastern time. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.